Welcome back to See Morning Show. It's time for Movie Talk. Woo! Week, we try to offer you some of our recommendations and see if any of them fit. So we're going to yeah. start with my recommendation. Okay, today. Grandpa. All right. <laughs> our first recommendation is Amsterdam, just freshly oh. released, oh, yes. written and directed by David o. Russell. Amsterdam, which was set in the 1930s, specifically 1933. It follows two World War I veterans, Bert Berenson, a doctor who is played by Christian Bale, and Harold Woodsman, a lawyer played by David Washington, son of Denzel. Ooh. Right, the pair are approached by Elizabeth Meekins, who is played by Taylor Swift. She plays the daughter of their former regiment commander and to complete an autopsy of his body after his suspicious death. However, soon they become the suspects in Elizabeth's murder after she was pushed in front of a car. Spoiler alert, guys, Taylor Swift doesn't last in this one. Oh, no! <laughs> Two of them go on the run to discover who was after her father. Now, they reconnect with their old friend, Valerie Vose, who is played by Margot Robbie. I love her. Somehow become entangled in a twisted plot against the U.S. government. <laughs> this period drama is largely fiction, although some elements were inspired by history. Now, I'll Ooh. add on a little bit more to that because... Why do you like this film? I like this film, first of all, because of its... I'm a bit shallow, just because of the star-studded cast. <laughs> that's what attracted me it. to begin with. So I mentioned Margot Robbie, Christian Bale, yeah. Taylor, Taylor Swift. Swift. Anya Taylor-Joy is in it. Uh, yeah. Rami, Mal yeah. Rami Malek. Rami Malek. Oh, okay. oh he's Malek. awesome. Robert De Niro. Whoa. Uh, Mike Robert Myers. Zoe Saldana. What? Chris Rock, as you saw in a little clip there. That's so star-studded indeed. And they all, like, balance each other out. Nobody tries to overpower the other. Yeah. And it's, it does keep you guessing. Like I mentioned, there was a bit of a spoiler. Um, but that is This is not a whodunit, right? Um, okay, well, that's what I thought it was at first. Right. However, it starts off that way, but it ends up being this kind of a conspiracy story mm. about a plan to overthrow the U.S. government. That's all I can say without okay, actually okay. spoiling the movie. However, okay. when I look more into it, it was actually based on a plot that was uncovered. So apparently, oh. uh, they did not admit it at the time, the U.S. government. However, late, years and years later, they admitted that this actually did happen. Oh. It was a conspiracy for some people to try to overthrow the government. Mm. However, it was thwarted by some people. Now, these characters are all fictional. Okay. But the story itself did inspire this movie. All right, wow. there's some truth. There is some truth to all humor, and it is a bit of a humorous movie as well. There's some yeah. funny parts. I don't know if it's supposed to be funny or I just found it <laughs> funny, but it was uh, enjoyable. All but it's David right. Russell, always humorous. That's right. There's so he threw in, he peppered in a few kind of funny <laughs> moments in it. And, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. Anyway. All right, okay. I will watch it. Yeah. Yeah, don't watch week. it if you're a Swifty, though. <clears throat> hey, I'm a Swifty. I'm a Swifty. <laughs> yeah. She dies. I would say okay. just tune in for the first five minutes. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, let's go to my second recommendation. Nope. Whoop. That's what? the actual Jordan thing. Peele. <laughs> Ooh. Right? Oh, Stephen Young is there. He's Daniel cool. Kaluuya? Mm. Right. Always, Another right? Star-studded yeah. cast. Always. So, this movie follows a grief-stricken horse trainer O.J. Haywood, who is played by Daniel Kaluuya, whose father ran a successful horse training business mm. and provided horses for Hollywood productions and even commercials. After O.J.'s father, played by Keith David, dies in a mysterious, gory accident, O.J. tries to keep the now-failing business and accompanying horse ranch afloat with the help of his charismatic, estranged sister, Emerald, who is played by Kiki Palmer. Palmer. But things get even more complicated for the Haywoods as they notice a mysterious cloud on the horizon over their ranch. They enlist the help of a tech store employee named Angel, played by Brandon Perea, and a gruff, highly respected cinematographer, Antles Holst, played by Michael Wincott. OJ and Emerald then decide to investigate this otherworldly cloud and try to make it big with their findings. Ooh. What do you like about it? I watched the movie. Did you watch the movie? Jennifer? No, I didn't watch it. I didn't like it, actually. No, you know, these, <laughs> these two movies both scored kind of in the 60s on IMDb. Right. Um, why, why did you like it? Why did I like it? Because of Jordan Peele. Right. I knew that no matter how the movie was executed, there'd be yeah, yeah. a message behind the movie. Yeah. Did you, were you, what did you interpret from the movie since you saw it? Well, first I, was, I was a little bit like confused. Dude, what are you trying to say, man? Because I love Jordan Peele when he first came out with Get Out, right? I with thought... It was an issue, a racial issue that he was um, trying to discuss in yeah. the film, and it was superb. He packaged it in this horror 
a genre, right? Mm. And this, I think he was just trying to comment on the phenomenon of people just trying to record everything sensational to get attention or something, yes. right? Very similar. Yeah. So I, I love movies like this where I get to do some research after and try yeah. to find out what the director <laughs> actually meant because right. I'm not that smart. So apparently <laughs> Jordan Peele did have a hidden message and okay. his message this time, and I think he's a victim of his own success due to Get Out. Yeah. Everybody expects that move, any other movie he makes to be yeah. the same yeah. or on the same level. It's like M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Yes. After Six Sense, Downward everyone wanted another Six like, Sense, and that's not going to happen, right? No. He has different ideas that he yeah. wants to express. And this one, you're very close, actually. What he <laughs> wanted, and this is, I got this from Screencraft. They do a lot of reviews for movies. Yeah. They actually said that what he is trying to display is this quote unquote spectacle that everyone's chasing. Yeah. For example, oh. fame or yeah. money. And each yeah. one of them actually had a different thing that they were trying to, <laughs> oh, to chase out of this. Yeah. So for one, the Stevens character, he wanted, uh, he was a famous child star. So he yeah. wanted to relive that using this to his advantage. Oh. Meanwhile, the, uh, the sister wanted money. You know, they all wanted different things. Whereas Daniel, the main character didn't. And that was yeah. what made his character different from the others. So, so Marie's the guy that right. She, yeah, absolutely. I think he nailed it. And um, uh, one more thing that I liked about it, this is supposed to be like a, a horror thriller, and I hate categorizing movies. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, a lot of it was shown in the daytime. A lot of horror or thriller movies are set at night. Yeah. yeah. And it's hard to see, maybe because I have bad eyes, but most of the time, <laughs> it's in the darkness. And this one, it was in daylight, and if yeah. it can still kind of yeah. get a rise out of you, I yeah. think it's a very effective directorial. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I should thing. watch this one, because I like Us. Um, better. Oh, you like Us? Like, I like Us better oh. than I like Get Out. I, get really? Out, get Out, I don't yeah. really like it. Yeah. I like them all. I just have to go to it with an open mind. And yeah. it helps uh, if you want to watch a Jordan Peele movie, yeah. don't read anything about it. Yes, go in blind no. because that yeah. way you'll come out, you know. I went in blind, blind and I went out blind still. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jordan. I mean, I love your get out, by the way, man. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I love so, it. That's it for me. <laughs> love, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these are only recommendations because, you know, we're giving our subjective views on these yeah. things. And my personal... Uh, choice is The Fablemans. Oh. Recently I watched it at the cinema. So this is Steven Spielberg's semi-autobiographical new movie that flashes back into the 1950s. This is Spielberg's childhood growing up in a Jewish family. So the film opens with the young Sammy Fablemans who was played by Matteo Zorio and Francis Defford as a child and Gabrielle LaBelle as a teenager seeing his first movie, The Greatest Show on Earth. Now, young Sammy's formative years go hand in hand with his uncomfortable home life, which includes a free-spirited mother played by the beautiful Michelle Williams. She eagerly supports his creative impulses and literal-minded scientific genius of a father who sees movie making as an impractical hobby. It's just a hobby, son. <laughs> now, a lightly fictionalized dramatization of his childhood, the film explores how a series of tension between a father and mother, science and art, responsibility and ambition mirrored each other, and how a boy working through those tensions with an 8mm camera grew up to become the highest grossing director of all time. Wow. This is a slightly long movie, but it is indeed a beautiful movie that explores about childhood, that explores about the relationship between parents and the child. What I love about this movie is the relationship between the mom and the little Steven Spielberg. Yeah, of because course. Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams. She's, <laughs> she's amazing. amazing here. And I think she's going to get nominated in the, you know, the award shows just because this role is different because Michelle tends to play really depressive, yeah. sort of like sad roles, which she did wonderfully, yeah. all of them. But this time, she's playing someone who's outwardly cheerful, really? outwardly trying to be okay, raising four kids, but at the same time struggling, trying to also exert her creativity, but she can't because she has to raise four kids. And just the honesty, the honest relationship between the mom and little Steven is just beautiful. So you guys mm. have to watch it. Okay. Why do you suppose oh. he decided at this point of his life to share his story. Like, this is his actual story about his life <laughs> yeah. to everyone. I mean, has he just run out of good ideas because yeah. he's had so many of them already? He's like, yeah, I'll just tell my life story. Or, you know, <laughs> also at the same time as you get older, right? You can't yeah. back but reflect your You're childhood like, yeah. and trying to That's process true. it all, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Fablemans is a good one. I've, I want, I've been wanting to watch this, but yes. again, I, my time is very limited. My two <laughs> recommendations, ironically, were the only two movies I've seen recently. <laughs>
Yeah, that's a long okay. time ago. Beauty. That's yeah. very honest, Paul. Yeah, and the second one also explores relationship between parent and child. It seems that it's a theme in my life at the moment. <laughs> it's a French movie by Celine Schiama. She's a female director. I love female directors as well because they tell stories from female perspective and point of views. Yeah. It's called Petite Maman or Maman. Little Mother. This is following the death of her beloved grandmother, eight-year-old Nelly, accompanies her parents to her mother's childhood home to begin the difficult process of cleaning out its contents. As Nelly explores the house and the nearby woods, she's immediately drawn to a neighbor her own age building a tree house in the forest. What follows is a tender tale of childhood grief, memory, and connection. The director, Celine Sciamma, continues to prove herself as one of the most accomplished and unpredictable contemporary French filmmakers with her follow-up to Portrait of a Lady on Fire. That was also amazing. And the uniquely emotional Petite Maman. This is mm. amazing. I'll just tell you a little bit. You see these two girls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They actually belong to different periods of time. Oh. So one girl is in the present moment. But the other girl, who looks like her, right. was actually her mother Aww. some years ago. That's sad. And they're coexisting they met. in the same time. Exactly. Really? To no. figure out, like, to understand each other better. That's deep, bro. I know, that's what I'm saying, Shana. <laughs> the dialogue is super simple. The duration is short, only about 17 minutes. Okay. Really? Okay. But the message is so profound. It's basically trying to explore what would you ask your parents if you could ask a question, because sometimes we assume that we know our parents, right? Yeah. yeah. We know their childhood, what happened to them. But do we actually understand what they felt when they were kids? Yeah. So there's this question that this daughter asked the father, actually, the, the grown father. Dad, what were you like? What did you feel when you were a child? What were you like when you were sad? What were you like when you were angry? What made you sad? What made you angry? These are the questions that we don't ask our parents, right? True. Right? Yeah. <laughs> now you're thinking, you're like, yeah, yeah. Actually, Well, yeah. actually, I can add something to that. I never asked this to my parents. However, my kid, my daughter especially, asks that of me. She asks me <laughs> everything. <laughs> and I think the difference is there. I wasn't very close with my parents, literally geographically. Yeah. We were very far apart as well. Yeah. So Different when generation. we did get together, I did feel that generational gap. Yeah. And I believe that, um, I, think, I, I guess it's up to our family structure whether yeah. we want to bridge that gap yeah. because I mean what does this movie uh, tell you I mean yeah. it, I haven't seen it but what it says to yeah. me is that perhaps that gap that we always feel gets wider and wider as our kids get older True. is due to the fact that we never existed at the same time so we're never really on the same wavelength yeah that's the problem with baby boomers right yes they they have they this have a huge gap yeah, right? huge gap and yeah. difficult of um, communicating yeah. your their feelings yes. with you right mm -hmm. you don't know them no, person. you don't know them. And this film explores, you see the poster is very beautiful. It's like... Which one's the mother? <laughs> uh, I think the mother is the red, red one. Oh. Yeah, in red. They're both very cute. Yeah, so they're embracing each other to understand each other better in the present moment. Ah, oh. it's gorgeous. I haven't seen it and it's That's touching That's so already. deep. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I have a daughter. <laughs> That's exactly. so deep. Uh, and mine is very cheesy. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. it's okay. Okay, it's my turn now. Yes. <laughs> hey, go. <laughs> this is my movie recommendation. So the first is the Before Trilogy. Hey, no This fair. is not cheesy, <laughs> You can't Shana. choose a trilogy. That's three movies. Come on. Three movies in... Um, <laughs> but you have to see every, uh, every movie. Um, yeah. This three uh, movie, you have to see it all at once. So the cornerstone of, of director Richard Linklater's career. Long exploration of cinematic time. And this celebrated three-part romance captures a relationship as it begins, mm. begins again, deepens and strains over the course of almost two decades. Ah, oh, so relatable, uh, yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Chronicling uh, the love of Celine, played by Julie Delpy, and also Jesse, played by Ethan Hawke, from their first meeting as idealistic 20-somethings to the disillusionment they face together in the Middle Age mm. and <clears throat> the Before Trilogy, also serves as a document of a boundary pushing and extraordinary, extraordinary uh, <laughs> <laughs> collaboration between director and actors. 
So as the Delphi and Hawk imbue their characters with a sense of lift-in experience and age on screen along with them. Yes. Especially between part one and part two. Yeah. Aging going. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I love this. I love this trilogy. Why do you like it? Love because it. it's very real and yes. also the conversations are very real you know there's the chemistry you can feel the chemistry even though there's no kissing scenes in the in the in the second part right yes. and i don't know i just love it because because it felt it felt different from from you know all these rom com um, yeah. that you always see. It doesn't on follow the standard format yeah. that we're so yeah. used to. It's right? so real and it's so vulnerable. Mm. It's just it opens a lot of discussions yes. um, yeah. and and it reflects on your relationship with your spouse. All right, so I'm gonna uh, hold you to that trilogy thing. Uh, mm. If you had to choose one, because you're only allowed to give one recommendation, yeah. which would be your favorite? Before Sunset. Me too. Really? Before yes. Sunset. Mm, the second one. The I love the first one, just because I've only seen two. I haven't seen Before Midnight yet, but I love the first one because mm. everything was just so Easy. unknown. Unknown, yeah. yeah. And then the second one was a bit sad for me because it reminds yeah. me of past relationships that you've had, whether it's yeah. friendships or friendships with family, that you kind of drift apart and then yeah. you kind of... You know, kinda you catch up again. again. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's you got a sad up. tone for it. But when I come to think about it, um, in every trilogy, I always like the second part better. <laughs> really? <laughs> really. Because in, in The Lord of the Rings, I love the two towers. Ah, oh, like Return of the Jedi. <laughs> right? There you right? go. I always <laughs> love the, the second oh. one. Okay, so that's my um, romantic uh, recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> now? It's probably three of the most romantic movies ever. Right, right. Because it's so real, like it's you said. It's so real. Yes. Oh. Now this one, <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> this is the with Cillian Murphy, right? Yes, <laughs> the second recommendation is 28 Days Later. Hey, it's not a part two, yeah. this is a part one. No, this is a part one, <laughs> I love this one. I've seen it like a thousand times. 28 Days Later is a 2002 British post-apocalyptic horror film directed by Danny Boyle. Set in Great Britain, just after the turn of the 21st century, the story depicts the breakdown of society following the accidental release of a highly contagious virus <laughs> and focuses upon the struggle of four survivors to cope with the ruination of the life they once knew. A critical and commercial success, the film is widely recognized for revitalizing the zombie genre wow. and introducing fast zombies. <laughs> Fast zombies, you're right. <laughs> so the film spawned the 2007 sequel, 28 Weeks Later, as well as the graphic novel, 28 Days Later, The Aftermath, and a comic book series of the same name. Wow. Good, good one uh, going with the first as opposed to the second. I like the first better yeah, as well because right. it was still, again, it, a lot of unknowns, whereas yeah. the second yeah. was more like what had already happened. I yeah. like this one. It was a very good choice. And even though it's old, but every time I see it, you know, it's kind of gives me the... The creeps, this is very, I think, very iconic. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very one of the more real ones because it, it explores human relationships as well. Yeah. It admits all of this. And like, I remember one part, again, spoiler. Sorry, guys, it is movie <laughs> talk. Um, <laughs> the part with Blen Brendan Gleeson, that part really disturbed yes. me. Yes. I don't know I why know that that's one. the part that sticks, that, that part, scene yeah. where he got infected. When oh. he when he poked the zombie, yes. right? right. And, then and it just accidentally, accidentally he got fell infected, not even from being bitten or anything. That part really disturbed oh. me because oh. I love Brendan Gleeson. Who doesn't? Yeah. He's like a teddy bear. I want to hug him. You yeah. know, I love his son. Yeah, me too. Yeah, of course you do. Of course you do. When you mentioned Bre exactly. When you mentioned Brendan Gleeson, I'm like, yeah, distracted. Donald completely. Gleeson, yeah. why listening. so cute, you red hair, beautiful creature. <laughs> but other than the film, the um, the scoring is also great. Really. And the Who's soundtrack. Who's scoring? Is Who, who's scoring? Um, I forgot. Um, I think it was Carter Burwell, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm. But it's great. So watch any Danny Boyle films, and you yes. get very nice recommendations for it. Soundtracks, yeah. songs, scores, mm, anything. There you go. Well You've got six. No, not six movies. It's actually six eight. 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 No, eight. You have a trilogy. Because mine is right. <laughs> and if you throw in twenty weeks, wait, twenty-eight weeks later, they've got nine. So there you go. Guys. A few bonuses for you. <laughs> there you go. This is fun. We should do this every week. Give okay. recommendations. I'll, I'll watch some new stuff. <laughs> yeah, some new stuff. Hey, old and new, there will always be some really good classics, right? And also some amazing new ones. Who will be classic one day, 40 years later, when we're in our 80s, yeah. right? All right, we're going for a quick break. And 40. when we return, Paul will uh, return with some of the highlights from the world of sports. We'll be right back.